There it is, Build Your Church. Today is our last day of Build Your Church of this series. And I wanna ask you guys this question. Have you ever been on a journey? Now, I'm not talking about a cruise. I'm not talking about like a pleasure trip. I'm not talking about one of those times that you go on vacation and everything just happens to work out. I'm talking about like a journey, like where you might not even know if you are going to reach your destination because that's what we're gonna follow the Apostle Paul on today. My family and I, last summer, we went to Washington State to visit my sister, and we did a lot of hiking. And one of the days, we were gonna go see this waterfall, and it was a short, like, three-mile there and back hike to go visit this waterfall. The kids could swim in the bottom in the pool. And we drove up up to the parking spot, and the map was a little different than the one that we had on our phone, but, you know, no worries. Like, we're, we're in for it. And we did reach a destination, but it was a viewing place for the waterfall and not the waterfall itself. So we're, we're okay. We can see the waterfall now, so we're going to go there, and we can go on this journey. Well, it, it looked something like this, like these tiny little trails, and we were trying to make our way through this giant forest to get to this waterfall. Well, we did, and it was great, except but then we also then had six miles now to get back to our car. So, uh, so that was quite the journey as well. And we had little kids, and so we're telling stories and jokes and just kind of like bribing them to like get to the car. We had like chocolate energy bites that were holding out like the stick and carrot to just try to get back to the car. But that for us was a journey. And today as we wrap up this series, Build Your Church, We follow the Apostle Paul on his journey to Rome. Now, a few weeks ago, Ben shared with us about Saul's conversion when the scales were removed from his eyes. You guys remember? In Acts 13, 2, we see Saul's initial calling. And it says, one day, as these men, the leaders of the church at Antioch, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. This was the apostle Paul or Saul referred to both ways. Um, This was his commissioning. This was his initial calling. And he went on multiple missionary journeys with Barnabas. And then they came back for this big council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And then Paul went out with Silas, as we learned from Jose last week, the story of Paul and Silas. Now, fast forward a few years, Paul has had a really effective, powerful ministry in the city of Ephesus. And in chapter 19, verse 21, we see Paul there in Ephesus, and he says, Afterwards, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Acacia before going on to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go to Rome. Paul has really just, he wants to get to Rome. I must go. That word in the Greek for must is the same word that Jesus used in Luke chapter four when he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom. So this is an imperative. Paul must get to Rome. And so he gathers the people of Ephesus together. He gives them some instructions. He tells them about his mission and he tells them that he's never gonna see them again. So he says, and now I am bound by the spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. That commissioning that he received when they prayed over him and sent him out, he says his life is worth nothing to him unless he uses it for finishing that work that was assigned to him by the Lord Jesus. So Paul in chapter 19 felt compelled to go to Rome. Now he feels bound by the Spirit to go to Rome. But wait, like any good journey story, there is some, you know, like there's some conflict here. So, um, so it says later in chapter 20, we went ashore and we found the local believers and we stayed with them for a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Rome. So wait, Paul says, I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Rome. I'm compelled by the Spirit to go to Rome. And now... He's not supposed to go to Rome. It gets better. So then it says, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, he took Paul's belt, and he bound his own hands and feet with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. So Paul says, I have to go to Jerusalem. I'm bound to go to Jerusalem. I have to get to Rome. And they're telling him, 
No, when we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So we, the we here, by the way, is Luke, the author of the book of Acts, inserting himself into the story when he says, we arrived on shore and we met with the local believers and we all begged Paul not to go on to Rome. That is Luke telling us that he was one of the people telling Paul not to go. But Paul said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Paul is so sure of his calling. He is so confident in what the Lord has called him to do that he is willing to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. He's willing to give up whatever it takes, to suffer whatever it takes. He knows that he has suffering and jail lying ahead. And Paul has this attitude of, I am willing to do whatever it takes. And I feel like we all have this attitude inside of us somewhere too. It's just a matter of how we apply it. How many of you in this room have run a marathon? Who are our marathon runners? Because yes, I love it. So those marathon runners are in like the top 1% of the population. So great job, you guys. My husband ran a marathon and all the way leading up to it, he was willing to do whatever it takes to run this marathon. You know how it is. He gave up sugar, he gave up um, sleep, he ran every day, he trained really hard because he had this goal in mind that he was going to run this marathon. For me, my whatever it takes attitude comes when we're talking about my kids. I'm willing to do whatever it takes for my kids to make sure that they are well and healthy. My daughter had had some health issues and she was on a bunch of daily medications and she had activity induced asthma and it was really, it just kept getting worse and worse. And I was willing to do whatever it takes to get to the root cause and we did. Thank you, Jesus. We found out she's allergic to wheat and now she's off all of her medications once we found that out. So praise God. But that's where my whatever it takes attitude comes in is when it has something to do with my kids. What about for you? What is what is the place where you're willing to say, I will do whatever it takes to reach this goal, to do this thing for your kids, for your family? Because sometimes I feel like I'm right alongside with Paul. Like, yes, Paul, let's go. We're gonna love God, love people, and share Jesus, whatever it takes. But then other times, like last week, I went to Publix, and um, I had my hat on and I had my headphones in and I honestly, I just, I did not want to talk to anybody. I just wanted to get into Publix and get those couple of things that I needed and then just get out. I was just praying that nobody recognized me and nobody came up to me and tried to talk to me about something. And sure enough, somebody from church recognized me and said hi and I'm like, hi, and I'm just trying to get through Publix. And then somebody from my Bible study is actually working behind the counter and wants to have a conversation with me and so stopped to do that. And then in the parking lot, someone else Like, it was a total stranger, like, asked me for help. And I'm just like, okay, Lord, here I am studying Paul and his whatever it takes attitude. And I don't have 10 minutes of my day in Publix to even even talk to people. So let's continue to learn from Paul. Let's go to Acts 21, where Paul finally ends up in Jerusalem. And a great riot followed. Paul is in the temple here in Jerusalem. He was grabbed and dragged out of the temple And immediately the gates were closed behind him. And as they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. So Saul is being beaten. They're trying to kill him. Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains and asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some shouted another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him, and the crowd followed behind, shouting, kill him, kill him. Now, does this sound familiar? A mob comes and they shout, kill him, kill him crucify him, crucify him. A few weeks ago, Matt told us that when we follow Jesus, that our life starts to look like Jesus's life, that our story starts to reflect Jesus's story. And here is Paul, just like Jesus, going to Jerusalem, where a mob comes after him, shouting, kill him, kill him. And so 
while Paul is there, he asks the Roman guard in Greek if he can address the people. And then he addresses the people in their own language in Hebrew. And because Paul is a Jew and a Roman citizen, he has this multi-ethnic reality. And I think this is so cool because he's uniquely positioned to talk to both groups of people. So we see Paul's heart for the Jews. He wants them to come to Jesus and he's heartbroken when they reject him as the Messiah. And we see Paul's heart for Rome that he says he must get to Rome because there are, they are both his people. And maybe you can identify with that multi-ethnic reality. So Paul is speaking to the Jews here and he tells them his story. He just tells them his testimony, what God has done for him. He tells them how God has called him and they initially listen to Paul, but when Paul starts telling them that he's also called to the Gentiles, they start wanting to kill him again. And Paul is then taken back into the prison by the Roman officials, who then are going to beat him to find out what he has done wrong, to get him to confess his supposed crimes. But Paul says, no, you can't whip me. I am a Roman citizen by birth, and I deserve a fair trial. So they take him then to the Jewish Sanhedrin, like their court, just like Jesus went before different courts to get a guilty or not guilty verdict. We see the same thing here with Paul. So they take Paul before the Sanhedrin, which is made up of two groups of people. And Paul does something kind of crazy here. He kind of throws out this gauntlet because the Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection of the dead and the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So in the middle of all the chaos, Paul launches this, this bomb in the middle of the room and he says, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And then he stands back and everybody starts infighting. You've got all these priests and rabbis that are all arguing theology amongst themselves and it gets completely chaotic. And in fact, it says, as the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid that they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. Again, Paul is brought to safety by force, which I find really interesting. Um, but after a couple of really bad days, something incredibly special happens in this next passage. It says, that night, the Lord appeared to Paul. And he said, be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. Paul is in this dark place. He's been beaten again. He's in prison again. And he doesn't know what the future is going to hold again. But the Lord shows up for him to confirm his calling on his life. And has God ever done this for you? Have you ever been on your journey, on your path, and God just shows up in some, in some way using some person or some circumstance to confirm that you are doing exactly what he has called you to do? And I don't know what that looked like for you, but for me, it looked like the gift of a crock pot. Yes, a crock pot, hear me out, hear me out. So uh, just a, a couple of days after I said yes to Matt and Shelley to take this job here at Crosspoint, which I'm super excited about, I received some beautiful confirmations. And one of them was that my life group leader just randomly said, hey, I've got this extra large crock pot. Would you like to have it? Here's some ideas for some easy meals. And I had just been thinking about how I was going to be able to get everything done with taking on the responsibility of a new job. And here is my life group leader with this random gift of a crock pot. My best friend in New Jersey had called to say, hey, I just felt really led by the Lord to pray some commissioning prayers over you. Can I do that for you? And some things just completely fell off of my plate so that I would have space for the thing that God was calling me to do. He met me right where I needed him and he confirmed his calling on my life. And it was not as glamorous as Paul's encounter with Jesus, but the Lord showed up for me in that moment. And he certainly showed up for Paul, which is good because it says the next morning, a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. So there were more than 40 of them in this conspiracy. Now, this is the negative example, right, of whatever it takes, because these men are willing to not eat or drink until Paul is dead. They're willing to do whatever it takes to kill him. And so this is the negative example of that. But Paul's nephew just happened to overhear their plot. And again, Paul is rescued by these Roman officials and taken to safety, which at the time is another prison. He's actually sent to this man named Felix, who is a ruler, a former slave, who is now the governor of Judea. 
So the historian Tacitus tells us that Felix exercised the power of a king with the instincts of a slave, that this man was shrewd. So the Jews come to Felix and they give him all these trumped up charges and Felix isn't buying it. He wants to keep them happy. So he keeps Paul in prison, but he doesn't bring him to trial again and he doesn't allow the Jews to kill him. He just kind of sits back and waits. And Paul is there with Felix for two years in this prison. Now, people are able to visit him and he's allowed to get what he needs. But I don't know if you've ever been in this situation where you know that God has called you to do something and you're in this season of just waiting for it to happen and you've got no control over the timing. And that's what's happening here with Paul. For two years, he's in prison under Felix, just kind of waiting because he knows that the Lord had said to him, you will go to Rome and witness for me there as well. And it's really neat because God did not forget about Paul. And the timing was very special because after two years, Felix was replaced by this other governor named Festus who asks Paul if he's willing to go back to Jerusalem and stand trial. And Paul insists, I am not guilty of any of those crimes. I appeal to Caesar. So Festus confers with his advisors and then replies, very well, you've appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice to pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. There's this prisoner here, he told him, whose case was left for me by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priests and Jewish elders pressed charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. When his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day, and I ordered Paul brought in. But the accusations made against him weren't any of the crimes I expected. Instead, it was something about their religion and a dead man named Jesus, who Paul insists is alive. I thought that was really neat. I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things, so I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to have his case decided by the emperor. So I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar. So the next day, King Agrippa, his sister, all the prominent men of the town, the military, they all gathered to hear Paul's story and his defense. And this is really cool because it fulfills something that Jesus said about Paul all the way back in chapter 9, verse 15. He said, Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. So with this captive audience now of Gentiles and kings, exactly as Jesus said was going to happen, because of Paul's whatever it takes attitude, the gospel is spread. Paul relays his entire testimony, telling about how he used to try to kill the Christians, and now he has become one of them, telling them about Jesus, who they insist is dead, but Paul insists is alive. And he's sharing the whole gospel, and he concludes, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And King Agrippa interrupts him, and he says, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? And Paul replies, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left, and as they went out, they talked it over and agreed. This man has done nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. But he did appeal to Caesar, so to Caesar he will go. So Paul is then put on a ship, finally headed toward Rome. Paul finally gets to go to Rome where he has been wanting to go for literally years and years. And here at last he's, he's going. But he's in chains. And he's under guard. And he is uncertain of his future or what he is going to do in Rome. God often works in unexpected ways, right? We've learned that this whole series, how God has built his church using unexpected people in unexpected ways through unexpected circumstances to build his church. Who knew that Paul's two-year imprisonment would lead to him being able to address the kings, the military, and the rulers? So Paul is going to Rome at last, not in the way he expected to, and this journey hits another snag. It's a nor'easter, an actual nor'easter comes, and now we get hurricanes here, right? But like on a boat in the sea 
with the nor'easter coming, these people are terrified, and I would be too, but Paul tells them, take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me, and he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. So Paul's <laughs> faith and his testimony to these people, knowing that God has promised this, Paul is reaching a whole new group of people. So then they shipwreck on the island of Malta, and some crazy things happen in Acts chapter 28. It says, near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. So Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying hands on him, he healed him. So then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. As a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. Again, because of Paul's obedience, a whole new group of people were healed. Just think about this for a minute. Because if we had that same whatever it takes attitude to share Jesus in every place that he puts us, whether it's an expected place or an unexpected place, if we had that same share Jesus attitude in all of the places that God puts us, how many more people would receive the gospel and how many more people would be healed? I think we would need more than three services, I'm just saying. It says, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the Three Taverns, and when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. And when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. And so Paul is now in Rome, and he gathers up the Jews there to explain to them what is going on. Now, in every other city that Paul had visited as a free man, he would go first to the synagogue and preach the good news of Jesus being the Messiah to the Jews. This is the Messiah that you have been waiting for. But things are a little different. He's under guard. He's under house arrest. And so he has to get the Jews to agree to come to him. So there was a time set, and they agreed to do this. And on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explains and testifies about the kingdom of God, and he tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. Now, this happens to us, too, when we share Jesus, right? That some people that we share Jesus with will believe, and some will not believe, but it is not up to Paul who does and doesn't accept the truth of the gospel. Paul just has to be obedient to God to share Jesus. And through Paul, the good news has now come to the Jews in Rome, and he was brought there in chains, but some really cool things happen while he's in Rome. Paul writes some really important letters to the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Colossae, and to a man named Philemon. Paul wrote four of the books of the New Testament while he was under house arrest in Rome. And then the very last verses in Acts tell us for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. That's it. That's the end of the book of Acts. Now, when we first started this, Matt told us that on one hand we had Luke, and on the other hand, we have Acts. And now I just, I want a third hand that tells us what happened when Paul went to Caesar. What happened during those whole two years? How did God use the people that Paul spoke to to continue to build his church? And we're not given any of that. And we're not even given like a conclusion. Like Luke doesn't end this book well. And I think it's because this book of God building his church doesn't end that God is still using unexpected people in unexpected ways through unexpected circumstances to build his church. And Paul, another Paul, that some of you might have known, Paul Ray, lived out this same mission for Jesus 
whatever it takes. The Lord recently called him home, but Paul, while he was alive, would mow his neighbor's lawn and he would serve in the background and he would pray for people and he would show up for people whenever they needed him. He loved God and loved people and shared Jesus all the time. Every time we went to House of Omelets or Perkins or had breakfast, he would always be sharing the gospel of Jesus everywhere we went. In fact, Paul was diagnosed with cancer and one day he had had a scan and he was calling my husband to tell him the results of the scan. And my husband's on the phone with him for 20 minutes and I'm just sitting there kind of like waiting to hear like what's the news and Paul is telling Edson all about how he got to share Jesus with these people at this place where he went to go get the scan and how he had gotten to walk through all these verses in Romans to tell them about who Jesus is and the hope of heaven and how he really got to share that gospel with them. And my husband's getting a little impatient and he says, Paul, we've been on the phone now for 20 minutes and I still don't know the results of your scan. And Paul says, oh yeah, it's bad. It's really bad and I'm gonna die, but I got to share Jesus with all of these people. Whatever it takes is a really hard prayer to pray because we want our family to come to Jesus, whatever it takes, right? But we also don't want anything bad to happen to them. And we want our families to be healed, whatever it takes, but we don't wanna be uncomfortable in any way. And we wanna be on mission with Jesus, but like when we have enough margin for it, when we have more hours in our day. But both Paul of the Bible and Paul of Crosspoint didn't live like this. So I want to ask us, Crosspoint, what is our attitude? Because I want to have that same attitude as Paul, as both Pauls, to love God, to love people, and to share Jesus, whatever it takes. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the testimony of the book of Acts of how you have built your church and you have used all kinds of people in unexpected ways to be able to do it. I thank you, God, that you are still doing that through us. And I pray that you would help us to be on mission with you, to do your work, whatever it takes. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen.